Go. Hello, Professor Zero and Manish. Um, on behalf of myself, Brian and Randy, uh, we wanna thank you throughout the year for helping us uh, put together this presentation and project, um, as well as everything else we've had throughout this program. Very nice. Sure, of course. So let's just start, we'll go a little bit quickly just for time's sake, because we have a lot, because we've already covered the background, but essentially the intuition for the project kind of builds upon the CAPM, the capital asset pricing model. And it was created by William Sharp in the 1960s. And essentially um, tells us that uh, expected returns can be modeled by one factor and that's its relationship with the market. And that has proven successful. And in regression studies, it's shown that over 70% of it can be studied. But then Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French, two professors at um, Chicago have come out that there are two additional factors. One is the size premium, which measures that small cap stocks outperform large cap stocks over the long term. The other one is the value premium, where um, high value premium, so stocks that have a high book to market will outperform stocks with a low book to market. So there are also two more that we're going to be using in our studies, one on profitability, where um, more profitable firms will outperform firms with less profitable, and the investment factor, where firms that invest more will outperform less. And then finally, Randy's going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Markowitz optimization aspects of it, where we really want to make sure we're operating on the efficient frontier. So we want to make sure we're removing any of our idiosyncratic risk. So now that we went through the background, we can kind of start diving into it. Um, so, um, like you said in the last presentation, yeah, an important part is to just replicate former French's studies. And essentially, we had access to the WORDS database, which is the Wharton Research Data Science Portal. Um, and essentially, it provides us with copies of that data, which is the counting information, and the CRISP information, which is time series trading information. So, stock prices, um, closing dates, and volume, and so forth. Essentially, we merged the two data sets together so that we can mix our accounting metrics with our um, stock portfolio. Then we can merge the data, uh, we portfolio group them. So we group them in sizes uh, by different subsets. And then we were able to perform and compare it to Farmer French's data dictionary, which is given um, online. And we saw that we had about 98 to 99% correlation. And um, that is what we kind of used going forward. And we uh, mentioned that there's flaws of the form of French, um, like endogeneality and heteroscasticity, um, basically OLS assumptions that we assume and that have been assumed in studies throughout the model that we need to mention now as a note, but we will continue forth and kind of mention them throughout. Quick, quick question, if I may. So yep. uh, actually a couple of questions. So the code that was used or the approach that was used to merge the data sets group, et cetera, all that is in that GitHub repository, correct? Or was it ad hoc? Yeah, so so we kept this one separate just because this wasn't as much of our study. So I can definitely share with you the um, document, the coding set, I can add it to the GitHub because this was mostly uh, the code is found online for this one. It essentially models um, through words databases, they provide an output that shows it because essentially because the data set is already out there, um, they provide useful resources to kind of replicate it. And so you use their code to rep to essentially, market. but just for the farmer French replication aspect. Oh, okay. And, and the second question is, um, why is there, you know, uh, it's a very slight discrepancy, but why is there any variance at all between the recreated data sets and the farmer French? Uh, yeah. Can you so explain where the difference comes from. Uh, we're not exactly sure. Um, our best guess was stock splits. Uh, the data set is supposed to incorporate um, adjustments like dividend adjustments, um, stock splits, um, or even merging. Um, but another idea that we potentially had that thinks has caused it is because sometimes when firms become M&A and consolidation, um, sometimes it gets every with minority stakes and adjustments. Um, but we're not exactly sure why there is a slight discrepancy in the data set. But fortunately, in our analysis, we don't use the replication that we use to be take directly the farmer French um, return. Okay. Dum -dum. So it shouldn't affect our analysis. Okay. So to talk about our objective, because this was a year long project that we shifted, um, as you know, our original goal was to maximize our information ratio. We wanted to take all of the idiosyncratic risk and essentially minimize it. And we believe that we would be able to do that by improving the accuracy and prediction through our DNN or the LSTM neural network. Once we kind of improved our accuracy and removed our mean square error um, residuals, we would be able to optimize our factor and asset readings. 
But as we started to do more research and dive into it, we found that it was very difficult to forecast factory returns. And because of that, when you want to look at um, forecasting, optimizing the factor and asset weightings, um, asset weightings, it became very difficult. When we dove farther and farther into the cap and and from our French, those are more used for asset pricing tools and not as much for um, prediction forecasting return tools. So because of that, we almost shifted to see if we can improve the asset um, pricing factor through stronger prediction because the cap M essentially is said to predict 70% of the variation. From a French is said to have predict about 90% of the variation. So we wanted to see if a neural network can almost improve it. And then at the end of the day, see if we can use that information to maximize the short ratio, because if we can remove any residual error in our model, maybe the discounting factor can be more accurate, which will in turn lead to some investment strategy. Um, and then uh, diving in, as you can see, uh, it's important to note that our data set started we took data or for sample period from 2000 to 2020, 20, and I just provided some uh, some summary statistics just to show. So as we can see, the market excess outperformed, and these are our premium factors. So SMB, which stands for small minus big, is essentially the small cap stocks outperforming the large cap stops, and we can see that it's let's see outperform. And by the way, this is on a monthly average basis. The only discrepancy here that is important to note that HML, which is the high minus low factor or um, the uh, value premium factor is negative, but that's in only because as of late, the value factor for some reason has underperformed as of late. So essentially discounted stocks have been outperforming premium value stocks, but throughout the entire investment universe since the 1940s, that has not been the case. It's just that our sample period that is showing of uh, the data. That because um, the profitability stocks and firms that invest a little bit more aggressively had outperformed. And then we just want to show the three stocks that we really focus on throughout our project is Apple, Coke, and Google, two of which, as you know, are tech stocks, one of which is a consumer staple stocks, all of which are, for the most part, large cap. Um, and as you just see, we just showed the return distribution. Um, because we wanted to show that it's approximately normally distributed as we go. And as you can see, uh, we won't be spending a lot of time on this aspect, but as uh, you see, the standard deviation is higher than all the factor premiums that we showed before, but their monthly returns are a little bit higher. That is because as you portfolio group the factors, it, the whole goal of it is to kind of remove um, some, is to increase diversification and therefore remove any excess variation. So we just wanted to show that as we continue to the next slide. And this is where we kind of dive into the EDA, which is the exploratory data analysis. As you can see, it's a group plot where each uh, essentially factor return is plotted against its other one. And the idea is that we want to see a scatter plot of the relationships, but it's important to know that for the model to essentially work, we don't want to see any relationships between our independent variables, because essentially they should be independent of one another to make sure that OLS applies. But as you look at some of them, for example, if you look at market returns in size and then profitability and value, you can both see a somewhat direct relationship. And the kind of concept is as the market returns increase, the size premium should in turn continue. So small cap should outperform. And the same idea with profitability and value. Most of the time, firms that are valued at a high premium typically are more profitable. That is kind of how it drives. So for example, price to earnings is a profitability, is a valuation metric, but the more um, valuable, uh, typically higher valued stocks would be outperforming and higher profitability. And then our third interesting thing before we dived into our analysis was the scatter returns of Coke versus the cluster returns of Google. As you can see on the right side, Google are the green dots and Coke are the orange dots, but you can kind of see that uh, the green dots are a little bit more um, clustered for the most part as orange are more scattered. And that will kind of tell us um, a little, uh, little foreshadow of that. I'm sure we're going to have a large variation in our Coke returns, which we will see soon. And then it's important to also look at a heat map correlation matrix. And we mentioned a little bit before that we don't want to see a relationship between our uh, independent variables. So you can kind of ignore returns for right now. We don't essentially, all the dark colored boxes are showing that we have a correlation under 3.0 for the most part or under 2.0, which we would like to see. Um, but as you can see, the um, market returns and SMB factor do share relationship, which uh, we didn't want to see. And part of it is our sample period. 
And then our three additional factors, the high minus low, the profitability factor, and the investment factor also share a relationship. And this is something that does skew our results because over the sample period, if we have a correlation with one another, there is autocorrelation, which will affect our model and sometimes generate a higher correlation coefficient than we are seeking. But we then broke them in, into two sample periods to see if there's any variation, which should speak to some aspects of non-stationarity because the distribution of these factors and the relationships, we want to see if they're consistent over time. And as you can see, they do not share a consistent fact, uh, relationship over time. So for example, as you look at SMB and HML from the relationship from 2000 to 2010, and then 2010 to 2020, we want to see that there's no relationship. And yet there is no relationship in the first decade, but there is in the second. So it's interesting to just kind of plot the differences um, as we continue in our analysis. And then, so now we can Sorry, kind can of- Can go back to the previous one? Of course. Um, the, the 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 labels are a little hard for me to read, but um, so you're saying the second decade you're seeing um, more correlation. Uh, yes, exactly. So the dark plots is essentially what we want to see. So in the top, ah, okay, uh, the bottom left and the top right, you can see it uh, shows performance, but it's not the same in the right. And even the dark plots are the numbers. Um, it's really hard to see see um, with the black background. <laughs> For me, at least on this screen, um, but at the core, I mean, uh, basically, that you're you're seeing uh, more correlation, higher correlation. Uh, yeah. So essentially, if you look at, for at the example, numbers, let's say apples to apples. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. not perfect, but essentially, it's the idea that the correlation, the relationship between some factors, do change over time. Is what right. we want to emphasize. Yeah. Um, okay. Oops, sorry. Now we can kind of dive into uh, the main part, which is the expected returns to farmer French regression, what we wanted to explore. And we kind of show it in two different ways, one of which is performing monthly regressions and then using those monthly adjusted coefficients to predict expected returns following a formula, which you'll see on the next slide. And the second is using OLA software package, uh, which predicts the function to generate expected returns each month. And we show both of those options on this slide. So. As you can see, uh, the, it's a, a snippet of code, but the top one follows the formula of what we should be modeling to generate our expected excess return, while the bottom one is actually doing the exact same function. It's just running OLS uh, multiple linear regression software packages on Python, and those should be generating the exact same results, except they do have some slight variation. So I wanted to include both of them just for the project purposes. Wait, wait, so I didn't follow that. The, the, mm -hmm. the, what's the first one? The first one? So the first one follow, option one essentially follows the uh, expression listed right above it, which is what we are exploring. Right. This is the, uh, essentially the five factor uh, from a French regression formula. And okay. it follows multiple linear regression. So and, you use Python. Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then in the second one, we follow OLS multiple linear regression. Um, using essentially the same formulas, because as you, as you can see in the first one option, we take each respective beta and multiply it by each respective return, random variable return. And it, in the second option, it is doing the same thing, except it for some reason generates slightly different uh, results. So we just wanted to show both of them. Okay. And then as you can see, this is uh, for the most part our results and this is what kind of outputs. So like I said, it is slightly different results. So for example, Apple in January of 2019, its actual return was around four to 4.2%. Uh, option one generates about 12% prediction while option two generates 15% prediction and so forth for three stocks all the way down our sample period. We were able to perform this for all every month for 2000, 2020, but we are showing it for 2019 uh, just to snip it. And then we show the total residual error on the right, where you can see that we essentially take in the difference between the expected return and actual returns, um, square the deviations, and then measure it to compare. And as you can see, option two, which is the OLS fitting, um, performed um, a better model, essentially, it had less residual error. Now, I just want to visualize it so it's easier to compare. On the right is a graph that essentially shows over time, are over or under predicted residual error. 
and I plotted a red dotted line across it to kind of show you um, that if it's over the line, as in we have a positive residual error, that means we underestimated. So our actual return was actually greater than what we predicted. And um, under the line, oh, I'm sorry, there must be a typo. It says above the line twice. It should say under the line um, would be overestimated where essentially we predicted that it was going to be higher than what we actually saw. Right. And I, as you can see, it's about 50-50. And I actually ran, um, I actually summed um, all of the data points that are above zero and all the data points that are below zero. And it actually, for the most part, comes exactly to 50%. So it kind of shows that our model isn't skewed or biased any direction because for the most part, 50% have been overpredicted and 50% have been underpredicted, give or take which is uh, almost a comforting feeling moving forward. Right. Now you have the, the spikes that you can explain, right? The... Yeah. So it just, we show a graph and a little bit more of the variation, but for um, some reason, that's when there's more volatility in the market and we were just underperforming. And as you can also see, yes, Apple, we had um, so large variation from 2002 to 2003, but the biggest uh, variation that we've seen is Coke over time. For some reason, um, OLS predictions and multiple linear regression did struggle um, because it very much underpredicted um, Coke's returns, which we'll be able to show in about two graphs. So, as you can see, our strong prediction results were successive for Apple and Google. As you can see, the uh, the blue line is what we predicted, and the red line is what actually happened. And as you can see, our mean root square is very small because we were very accurate in our predictions more so for Apple than it was for Google. It's also important to note that uh, we were only able to generate stock returns for Google from 2014 on based on when it was able to go public um, from the subsidiary of Alphabet. So then these are the strong results. But then as we look at weak prediction results, we look at Coke. As you can see, it was run the exact same analysis using both options. However, we uh, substantially underpredicted uh, Coke's returns throughout the time. And when we say we, we do it both ways. We ran the same exact software, but for some reason, Coke did not generate nearly as accurate results as the other two. Right, it seems kind so, of vastly underpredicted, right? Yes, vastly underpredicted, both on the positive direction, both on upward direction and downward. It's direction. almost like some scaling factor is, is uh, uh, messed up. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it does get the trend, right? It does get yes. the direction, but somehow not the magnitude. Yeah, so exactly. could it be a subtle bug somewhere or? Yeah, we, I, I tried exploring that uh, when we worked on it and I even tried using different uh, individuals like stock returns and it didn't happen for any other asset um, prices that we were using. It was only for Coke for some reason. So maybe there's something within the data set that uh, right. affected the skewness of the Coke. Okay. I'm not sure. And then finally, we wanted to perform some um, statistical tests so we wanted to ensure that our data was stationary. And that's important because we want to make sure that uh, distribution, the mean and variance does carry through over time because this can affect our re uh, regression results. So we were able to perform a Dickey, uh, augmented Dickey-Fuller test on all random variables. And we found that all the results were stationary at a 95% confidence level. Then we also um, performed the hypothesis on multiple linear regression, and that's essentially what we're exploring. Does there is a relationship exist between asset returns and at least one observed factors? This is important because we are trying to predict the variation. And if we can say that there is a positive relation that continues over time, we will be able to show that there is a way to predict expected returns through some other range of variables. So when we ran our tests at a 95% confidence level, we saw that the market excess was consistent and statistically significant for all three stocks. How, and same with uh, the CMA or investment factor. However, the high minus low was significant for Apple and the SMB was significant for Google. Over time, for different statistical tests and asset instruments, sometimes some factors are statistically significant while other are, uh, others aren't. And there's many different ways to kind of perform this and test it and adjust it. But um, in regards to our regression results, this is what we found. And then I'm going to be passing on now to Brian to kind of talk about the. So, norm. so one quick qu question: the previous yeah. slide, um, I mean, you know, financial data is notoriously non-stationary, um, mm -hmm. and you have to do all kinds of yes. transformation to to work with that data, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm a little surprised that you found all the data stationary. Yeah, I should have clarified um, in the beginning. So originally when I ran this, it was most definitely not stationary on the test results. What I uh, saw that in farmer French regression, because it is important to make a stationary assumption, once you convert your returns to logarithmic returns, which we did, ah, okay. to account for continuous compounding, it was then found to be stationary. Got it. Okay. It may be added. I mean, probably have it in the report, right? These details. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we yes. definitely mentioned the uh, um, logarithmic returns in the report. Okay. Uh, now I'll be passing it on to Brian to talk about the neural network aspect. So as you see on your screen, we have two different models. So Jordan just beautifully explained his work with model one. Um, and so the theory is as such, right? We have we have these machine learning applications um, and I, I'd like to hesitate and, and kind of deliver this now that just because they're more powerful does not mean that they always fit the application. Um, that's the hint at uh, interpretability and complexity of the model um, is obviously hindered. There is no free lunch. Sure. Um, and so in essence, what I explored is model two here on your screen, right? Can excess returns be modeled um, as a three feature neural network um, with the idea that an iterative process of improving weights um, and a DNN artificial neural network, right? Depending on the amount of layers, uh, may be able to, ca to capture more variation than you know, the 90% that model one on your screen was able to capture. Um, so um, I'm going to focus most of my explanation sort of on the theoretical side of what this really is, how these things work, um, and then uh, explain the case study that, that we use to, to implement this and the, and, the, and the performance metrics coming out of it. So as Jordan mentioned, um, the, the Fama French OLS estimated to fit excess of three or four equities. Um, we threw another one there just as a test case. We're not, we're not going to show that to you. Um, it did work well. It's, we're not hiding anything. Um, we were just, again, just testing. Uh, so in essence, what, uh, once we have kind of a, a baseline, right, a benchmark, um, we're going to use the, the neural nets to, we're going to, we're going to build out a neural net um, to fit and estimate excess returns for those exact same three equities. And then we're going to compare out of sample uh, standard deviations of the uh, ordinary least squares, so the Fama French, versus the neural net, and see how those performances, how, how those raw values perform. And then Randy's going to, this is more Randy's part, but uh, part four, we're going, to we're going to create portfolios, uh, out of sample portfolios using those estimations and see how those portfolio performance metrics perform and see uh, against what really happened to see if there is, um, if there's add value in using a neural net uh, uh, against an OLS. Now, when you say neural net, you, you, you're you using, what, what features, feature variables are you using? Yeah, net? yeah, so uh, let's, back up to, uh, let's back up to model two here, uh, to slide 17, Jordan. So the three features are right there. They're market beta, um, small minus big, and your HTML. So we're literally using the raw values. Ah, okay. Um, we're using the raw values that are provided um, through uh, through the Fama French um, through the Fama French website. There's a beautiful Python plugin. You pull the data, you scale it, you do whatever you need. Um, you do some manipulation, and you just use those features right then and there. So the same features are used in both the exact things. same features in apples to apples comparison. Okay, good. Um, so a little bit about theory here. Um, I could get really, really deep in the theory. Um, I'm going to kind of walk a fine line here, right? So at each layer of the neural net, um, in essence, what's going on, right? So let's uh, let's represent a uh, a i minus one as um, the last sets, uh, the last layers, data data vector, um, and and the weights of i as the as the weights in so the weights so the let's call them tilts call them weights whatever whatever really works um, of this layer plus some bias term and we'll call that and and as we can see here that is a linear function right so where the neural net where the power comes in is iteratively updating the weights and the biases to drive down uh, your loss um, and I'll get to I'll get to the hyperparameters and what specifically is going on but um, at each layer, these two calculations occur when, uh, where at, once that ZI is calculated for the Z for each layer I is calculated, um, it's transformed via an activation function at each layer um, and then outputted as a, as, as a of that layer I and then passed on throughout and propagated throughout the, throughout the network 
um, depending on how many layers I there are in. Um, so once we have a general understanding of what's going on, we'll talk about the architecture that we used. Um, Jordan, next slide here. So there's a bunch in this slide, and, I'll, and I'm going to try to explain this as, as, um, as business friendly as possible. But um, so we're going to read this chart bottom to top uh, rather than top to bottom. So as we can see, our input layer, we have three features. Um, and as we propagate forward, so as we go up the, as we go up the slide here, we have a first dense, a fully connected dense layer of 64 nodes with a 10 activation. Then we have a dropout layer. Then we have a 36 node second dense layer with a sigmoid activation, another dropout layer, and an output layer. So what does all this really mean? Um, so a dense, uh, before I talk about why there's a dense layer, um, an LSTM cell was mentioned uh, prior. So LSTM, and this is in the report, um, and it's, I go a little bit into further detail in the report exactly what an LSTM layer really is. Uh, but what an LSTM layer tries to, to capture is non-stationary time series effects. So sentences, uh, so natural language processing is a big application to it. And in turn, so could financial data, more on the pricing side, right? So raw prices of a security do are not, are not stationary nor trend stationary. First and second moments are functions of time. Um, and hence, that would be a more appropriate ap application to an LSTM. And originally, that's what we were building. But I realized quickly that uh, the model was completely overfit, did not perform well out of sample. Um, and then essentially, we were, we, were, we were deploying a tool that was too powerful for a situation that we didn't need. Um, hence, we transitioned over to a, dense, to, a, to a dense cell where all nodes in each layers are all fully connected with each other. Um, and then we add dropout layers um, as an intuitive idea that not 15 years of financial data is needed to predict just tomorrow, right? We can do that. We can predict, we can have a general idea of tomorrow with a subset of that 10, of, of, of that 10 years of data. Hence, we have two dropout layers um, to, to uh, in other words, remove the confusion from the model. So we, we, um, we limit the, the amount of overfitting. Um, and so once we kind of pass through the entire entire layers um, and network, um, we backpropagate, and I'll explain uh, in the next slide a bit what the idea of backpropagating really means um, to uh, to produce optimal weights and biases to have to, to have the lowest possible loss given uh, given our data. So let's go to the next slide here. All right, so back backpropagation and loss. So what is what does that mean, right? So once once the network passes through um, passes through uh, once the network passes data through once it has an initial weight an initial bias in all in all layer uh, in all the vectors in each layer um, and so the idea that we the the idea of bag propagation is to minimize the loss of this neural net so what happens within the code this is not hard coded um, this is there's no there's no manual efforts here but uh, in, in other words a partial so in other words we need to understand the the relationship, the marginal relationship between the loss function and each, and each hyperparameter and each weight and bias of each layer, right? So we we calculate a gradient or a partial or a partial derivative with, uh, of weights and bias with respect to the chosen loss. Um, that's done via chain rule, fairly simply, and then it's just a simple optimization problem um, where we have where we have a positive semi-definite um, gradient uh, gradient gradient vector. Um, and then we iteratively we iteratively solve that optimization problem using gradient gradient descent, where um, our learning rate, which is something I'll talk about, is the step size in that uh, uh, numerical method estimation problem. Let's go to the next slide. So a bit of the hyperparameters that we use, um, as I mentioned, um, the the amount of nodes in each cell are mentioned were mentioned prior, um, but we'll pass the data through 130 times. So the epochs here. Uh, we'll, we'll pass in 64 um, observations out of time through our network as our batch size. We'll use we'll use a uh, we'll use 20% of the data as validation. So that's neither testing, neither uh, uh, neither testing, neither training. Right. So this is a separate data set that gives us a general idea of how it will perform out of sample, but it is not out of sample. It is still used as training. Um, as our loss, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we'll use mean square error, uh, we'll use the atom optimizer, and we'll use a learning rate of uh, 0 0.001. So what's the atom optimizer? Atom optimizer is um, um, a stochastic gradient descent um, 
method. So an atom optimizer, basically, not to, again, not to get into the mathematics here, but uh, uh, to solve the backwards propagation problem of minimizing loss, we use uh, we use the atom methodology, which is a form of uh, which is a modified form of stochastic gradient descent. And you're using what 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 sort of library are you using to? So um, it's it's literally on the next slide. Okay. Uh, before we go there, so how many layers does the neural network have? Uh, you had a um, Jordan slide twenty, please. So here's a uh, here's the uh, here's the visualization. Um, we have an input layer, and then we have two hidden layers, and then we have an output layer. So this is an artificial, not deep, meaning. Okay. And, and how did it come up with sixty four nodes? So. Um, where, uh, do, 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 do. so that's uh, Jordan, the next slide. Okay. Here, um, so here specifically, well, uh, I'll talk about the little bit of the hyperparameter tuning and uh, the beautiful Python applications that we have to do all this optimization um, via grid search. Um, we can obviously improve on that, but um, general understanding of, of kind of where those numbers come from, I'll, I'll walk through here. So through all of that, uh, through all of that, uh, tech talk that I just had, um, kind of high level what 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 just happened. Um, so we retrieve our data, we calculate our excess returns, all done in Python, pandas, scikit-learn. Um, and then Keras, uh, the Keras, uh, the Keras application within TensorFlow to build all this out in a sequential in a sequential architecture. So once we have our data retrieval and the excess returns, uh, we have we split we we split our data set into three groups, our trained validation and our test. Uh, we scale the data, very important here, very, very important that we're using, that all our data is on the same scale. Um, all the percentages are turned into raw values, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then so specifically, we'll use a min, uh, a min max scalar uh, as a function within scikit-learn, well-known machine learning methodology here to scale our data. Um, and so, and then we'll build out a sequential, we'll use the sequential architecture provided by the Keras, Keras library to build out this neural net in Python. All our hyperparameter tuning uh, will be using a basic grid search. So I'd like to put an asterisk on this. Um, is grid search the best thing? No. Um, in, in other words, I feed it general ideas of what I think these, what I think the hyperparameter should be, and it and it just basically fits every single possible combination and, and spits it back at me as to which produced the lowest loss. We can definitely use a Bayesian grid search. Um, we, we we have other optimization um, methodologies here. I just chose grid search kind of for the for the ease of use here. Um, and then Scikit, Scikit provides a beautiful wrapper uh, to Curious uh, to implement uh, a grid search on our hyperparameters. Uh, as we as we fit, try to go back here. As we fit, um, it's very important, as I mentioned earlier. To monitor the performance and um, and the over or under fitting of the model, we want to be seeing a beautiful um, a beautiful decreasing curve. Um, and hence, as we train, we monitor our epochs and loss loss of the, uh, the yeah, our loss over epochs over time. In other words, uh, to understand how well the model is adjusting over time. So, uh, how do we do that? Well, uh, Curious again provides beautiful beautiful opportunities to gather these specific uh, data points as it trains. Uh, we have CS CSV files of that, and when we just use matplotlib to beautifully plot this. And then to, to use our model, uh, we'll save it, um, and then we'll reverse transform our predictions. Well, sorry, we'll predict, and then we'll reverse transform using that same, um, same uh, the, the reverse version of the scaling that we did earlier in the model building. We'll go to the next slide here. So applying that methodology through the three stocks in the same exact time frame with the same exact factors as Jordan did, um, these are our results. So the top box shows the mean of the residuals. Um, and so I'd like to focus everyone's attention to the uh, the far right column in comparison to the uh, to the first to the far left column of the the, the, uh, the final French performance, right? So what we see here is that for Apple specifically, um, we have, Lower residuals, but at what cost? Um, we have higher standard deviations, um, and we and then similar similar ideas for Coke. Um, high, uh, actually, lower standard deviation than Fama French, but um, a higher residual here. Um, and so, 
the, though these numbers are not particularly impressive, um, nor are they better. Um, I mean, again, as I told Chorda the other day, we're not going to beat we're not going to beat the performance metrics of someone of, of a group that won a Nobel Peace Prize, right? Um, but in essence, why is this relevant? Well, these numbers aren't totally far off, and more importantly, as Jordan mentioned, um, there is for for the most part they are assumption free. Um, as, as Manish, as you prefaced earlier, financial data tends to be non-stationary, um, and then making it stationary also tends to be an issue at times. The neural net and honestly machine learning um, applications, for the most part here, um, do not require assumptions, they don't require checking assumptions, and hence, if we can get relatively the same metrics um, and the same performance assumption-free, there is that value there. Um, and hence, um, we'd like to suggest to use this this type of application more as of a more of a kind of an idea to be further explored. As you mentioned, uh, why sixty four, why two layers? All these questions. Um, I don't. I'm not. I'm not the subject. Uh, I, I'm not the end all be all of machine learning here. Uh, but definitely, a, um, uh, an engineer, someone who does this every single day, would be able to even further optimize a neural net on these three factors with the given output to further drive that loss down and further improve on these exact same numbers, assumption free. Next slide here, Jordan. Um, as I mentioned here, you know, the performance metrics might not be ideal, but the assumption free modeling aspect of them may be beneficial for equities with certain characteristics, the Teslas of the world. Um, and as I mentioned uh, before um, I even dove into all of this, there's no free launch just because we have possibly assumption free or better, better predictions. We lose some aspect of this and the interpretability issues continue to be an issue, but um, with time we have, um, we have methodologies to interpret these neural nets in some way, shape or form. Um, so I think that third asterisk in my opinion is kind of a diminishing issue, um, but still uh, it's important to note that. With that said, um, I'll turn it over to Randy to, uh, actually we'll go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, further optimization here, nodes, learning rates, um, optimize every hyperparameter can be can be continued to be tuned. Um, and as I mentioned, the next steps here is to interpret really what's going on under the hood, under the under the black box hood. With that, um, I'll turn it over to Randy to, for him to walk through exactly what he did um, and um, how to really put this put put this to work in uh, in kind of an asset management uh, an asset management environment. Uh, thanks, Brian. Yep. So at this point in the project. We have the expected returns from FMA French. We have the expected returns from the neural network. And now it's my job to actually put everything together into a portfolio. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, I just want to repeat what my initial expectations are uh, for the project. Uh, first, I just wanted to make sure I understood the Markowitz model uh, on a like theoretical level and so that I knew how to implement it. And then I would actually construct the model as a benchmark and um, make a deviation of it to compare the performance. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so the Markowitz model can be uh, observed as an optimization problem. Uh, so for example, uh, in the first one, we can see that the goal is to maximize the expected return of the portfolio uh, minus the risk measure times a risk aversion factor. And there are a bunch of different ways that the Markowitz model can be constructed. Uh, we could choose just to maximize the expected return uh, on the condition that the risk measure is below a certain level. And that also has the conditions that the sum of the weights has to equal one and that all of the weights are between zero and 0 0.5. Uh, it could be below zero if you allow short selling or it could be above 0.5. Uh, we chose that level uh, because we didn't want one asset to have uh, too high of an allocation. Uh, so moving on, uh, I also learned that there are some issues that we need to avoid. Uh, so for example, when determining the expected return and risk measure, we need to use the same time frame for the data. This is easy to check, and we just have to make sure to essentially use uh, the same exact data when finding the expected returns and the risk measure. And if you're using this to rebalance, it's important to check the values and make sure that there aren't discrepancies that are too large, uh, because that way it could lead to large transaction costs. And also it's important that the inputs to the model are good. And in this case, there are no issues there as Brian and Jordan have done a great job uh, with what they have done. 
Uh, so moving on, we actually constructed this model. Uh, so I won't go into the details of the code, but essentially what this is doing is first finding the expected return, which is each weight times the expected return uh, for that stock. You sum all of those to get the uh, expected return. Then you find the risk measure, which is the variance of the portfolio's returns. And so you can see as uh, a complex formula. And uh, yep, so going on. And next, you can set the constraints. Uh, so the first constraint uh, says that. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. So uh, where does the covariance matrix come from in yeah, the second uh, formula? Sure. Uh, so uh, we have the expected returns uh, from Brian and Jordan and the actual returns. We can use that as well. And uh, it was a simple formula. You just use, uh, I did it in a separate uh, uh, function uh, in Python. It's just like np.cov and then all of the data. And it gives you the covariance matrix. Using okay, so you use the sample sample covariance is what's it, what it's called. Yes. Because um, typically, um, so sample covariance can be tricky if you don't have sufficient history. I mean, in this case, you, you're dealing with what, three names, right? Three variables. Yes. So you won't have the problem, but let's say you had an universe of thousand assets, then you need a really long history. Otherwise the covariance matrix can be unstable. Um, so I guess you didn't run into that problem. Um, but the other comment I have is, so this is one approach using the sample covariance, simply historical data. The other approach is using the, uh, the factor model itself. So you, 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 if you know the factor covariances, there's a formula to use that to get the asset co return covariances, which is called the structure. You know, basically it's a structural approach. You assume the returns are explained through those factors. And um, so it might be interesting to calculate the covariance matrix using the factor covariances, which you can calculate because you have all the data. Um, well, I mean, maybe for in future, if you're interested. Um, but with three names, I don't think you would have any, any problems either way. Uh, but it's often good to compare. Definitely, yeah. All right. And we'll definitely make sure to do that um, going forward. Uh, uh, so next is to set the constraints. And the first constraint is saying that the sum of each weight has to be greater than or equal to one and less than or equal to one. So that forces the sum to be equal to one. And then the next constraint just sets the balance to be between zero and 0 0.5. And then the optimization itself is to just run opt.minimize. Oh, and in Python, you aren't allowed to maximize. Uh, this was uh, something tricky that I found. You have to minimize. So the objective function is actually the negative and we are minimizing the negative of that. So uh, going on, uh, here's an example uh, using some data. Uh, these are just uh, using six other stocks, as you can see on the screen. And I set the time frame to be uh, daily data uh, from August 2020 to February 2021. After you run everything, uh, the optimal ways are to invest primarily in Disney and in Tesla. Um, so uh, going on, it's important to note that what I just did when I constructed that model was slightly different than maximizing the Sharpe ratio because the formula for the Sharpe ratio is the excess returns uh, divided by uh, the risk. And that is slightly different than the optimization problem that I had done previously as I had to define a risk aversion factor. And in order to maximize the Sharpe ratio, you have to use uh, this formulation as on the screen. And the issue with this is that it's very difficult to optimize and you need to add auxiliary variables and modify the formulation. Uh, but fortunately, we actually found a workaround to this. Uh, so as seen on the next slide, uh, there is actually this uh, library, uh, as you can see, that has the maximization of the Sharp ratio built in. It's called, it uses the efficient frontier. All you need as the inputs are the expected returns and the covariance matrix. Uh, which we already calculated uh, from the first model that I had constructed. 
after you find the maximum sharp ratio using uh, those three uh, socks that we had used previously, Apple, Coke, and Google. Uh, for example, the optimal weights would be to invest primarily in Apple and Google. So uh, going on, uh, from those weights, you can actually calculate the portfolio returns. Uh, you just multiply each weight uh, by the return that day, and then sum all of the weights on that day. Uh, and so for example, uh, these are the monthly weights for 2019 for the portfolio. We can calculate the uh, Sharpe ratio and the mean and standard deviation. And it turns out to be a Sharpe ratio of 0.936, uh, which is um, a decent value. Uh, so going on, at this point, we have two different models. We have that first model that I made from scratch and that second model, which uses that built-in library. And there are benefits to both. Uh, for the first model, it's very easy to make modifications if you want to enable short selling or if you want to take into account transaction costs. But we are actually going to continue with that second model because that is the model that does maximize the Sharpe ratio. And that is what we are primarily interested in here. Uh, so going on. So what was the problem you had uh, with the approach to maximize the Sharpe ratio before you tried the library? Yeah, what, what sort of problem did you run into? Um, if we can go back um, a little bit to where it shows the two different um, models. Yes, right there. Uh, so the first model uh, on the top, that is the model that I created myself. And as you can see, uh, the goal is to maximize the expected returns minus a risk aversion factor times the risk measure. And that is slightly different than the Sharpe ratio because in order to find the Sharpe ratio, you have to take the excess returns and divide that uh, by the risk measure. Um, so in this case, it is very slightly different. You do get very slightly different results. It's not that significant, but it is not exactly the same thing, uh, which is why that second model is the one that should be uh, put forward with. I'd like to also respectively add that uh, the models you see on your screen, they're all linear um, in comparison to the Sharpe, uh, which is not in linear. Um, that may be a mathematical issue. Should you be, uh, well, not an issue, but it adds mathematical complexity in terms of optimization. Yeah. Well, it's not, I mean, the risk measure in the, even the first one is quadratic, right? I mean, it's a standard deviation or variance. So it's, it's, it's non-linear, but quadratic optimization is easier than a general non-linear problem. So I think you're right. Uh, Brian, so the other one is, is basically a quotient, right? It's a return adjusted yeah. for risk. So um, um, yeah, so it's, it's harder to handle. In fact, for, for the first version, actually not the classic Markowitz optimization, you can solve analytically. Um, there is a formula to do it uh, without the constraints. If it's, full, if it's not constrained, there is a formula to do it. Um, because quadratic optimizers, you, you can solve. Um, you can solve like analytically, um, but yeah, you're, okay. So you're, you, um, go ahead, I think I, I, I understand. Yeah, and um, yeah, that was a really great point by Brian as well. Um, and there was the issue of like linear versus nonlinear um, that we didn't have with that second model. Uh, so using that second model that does maximize the Sharpe ratio, we can use the expected returns uh, as well as the actual returns and see what the results are. Uh, so for example, uh, in the neural network, the weights are to invest primarily in Apple and Google, and it has the highest Sharpe ratio of 0.936. Uh, in the uh, Fama French uh, functional form, which is that first one that Jordan talked about. Uh, there's a mix between Apple and Coke and then primarily in Google. And that has the second highest Sharpe ratio of 0 0.730. And it's interesting that for the uh, basic predictions, which is that like other way that uh, Jordan constructed the model, uh, it actually has the same optimal weights as the neural network. But because the expected returns are slightly different, it will have different uh, Sharpe ratio. And of course, we can compare it to the actual returns as well. And as you can see, 
is to invest primarily in Apple and Coke. And the Sharpe ratio is um, slightly smaller than the neural network and the thermoff range models. Uh, so it's definitely um, really interesting results to compare. And we can actually visualize on the next screen what the portfolios are. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the uh, blue line are the actual returns. And the overall trend for pretty much all of these uh, follows the actual returns. Uh, and that just confirms that you know, we think that these expected returns did a great job um, with their predictions. You know, the um, like basic predictions and the functional form maybe like more closely uh, aligns with the actual returns and the neural network is great because it does provide another like uh, quantitative way to calculate the expected returns and it does provide uh, very good results as well. So Randall, right? Yeah. Hey, so basically this is an interesting chart. So you basically uh, reverse engineered uh, the process, right? Um, and and in order for you to be able to see which one actually best predicted. Now the actual return, because, you know, again, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's the blue line, yep. which is the one, uh, I guess in 29. So you, this is over one year. Uh, there was a drop and I guess it's a blue line. It's a, it's the furthest drop. Is that it? The actual return? Yes. And the closest one to it was the, is that the, that's not the neural network. It's not the, it's the basic predictions. Uh, yes, it's um, a little um, difficult to see. Uh, I do yeah. think the basic predictions um, do work uh, very well. So do you notice a difference in result when things are going well versus when things are not? going well? I mean, is it, is it, I mean, are the models uh, good on the way up and on the way down as well? Yeah, um, we, we do think that uh, the models uh, do work well, like when the like overall market is doing well and not so well. I mean, of course you can see this big drop uh, in the middle of the chart and pretty much all of the predictions like uh, for the most part follow that drop. Um, so like during times where the market might not be doing might not be doing so well. Uh, we can see that the predictions uh, like uh, do work uh, just fine when constructing the portfolio. So it is uh, like very interesting uh, to visualize in this way. Because once things are going back up again, I could see that the lines are not as tightly, right? The projections are not as, as tightly together as when you have a drop. So obviously it's a lot more difficult to predict when things are doing well Right. Why is that? Um, I, I can kind of speak because this had to do with a lot of the, the research I had in the preliminary aspect over the summer. And we unfortunately didn't get to explore the relationship with the econometric aspects. So, for example, sometimes uh, when you optimize the factory returns, they do different in different cycles. So certain credit markets will operate at different time periods that would be more consistent, whether we're in a drawdown period or if we're in during recession, deflationary periods. Different economic eco, um, the metric like time periods uh, show patterns on returns based on how you kind of uh, optimize certain factor relationships. You know what, uh, Jordan? This is actually a good point. So maybe I mean, obviously, you you have a job already at. Uh, where you where you got you got a job at um, uh, Hamilton Lane. Hamilton Lane, yes. Uh, but uh, for multi factor two. And I'm, and I'm actually speaking to you, but also to um, uh, uh, to Manish and um, Brian, uh, if he's got any time left. Uh, maybe on the multi-factor too, we could ask the new the students coming in, right? They could explore something like that. Could, yeah, I have a great article for them too. It's like okay. by MCI and they explore this and they show their optim like optimized results. And it was just difficult because as you could see, like we didn't really make any assumptions about forecasting. The model uses its current expected value. And because it's a random variable, we estimate it in different ways. At the end of the day, we never came out and we never said the market will generate 10% next month. 
you know, we're simply taking empirical data and coming up with different ways to optimize it. So because of that, we didn't want to like take a, uh, that big leap into that. But at the same time, yes, there's a paper that talks about like adjusting uh, the factor weights and the portfolio due to econometric like events. And like, I have like the article. The, Send me that. Maybe we could use this as a basis for, uh, yeah. for the fall. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Randy? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so going on to the next slide, there are some potential improvements to this Markowitz model. We could introduce nested cluster optimization, which uses clustering uh, to identify the weights along a cluster uh, of securities. And then it actually goes within each uh, cluster to then find the weights of the individual securities, which is a unique way because the securities are correlated with each other and that can shift the weights in the model. We can add a value at risk measure, uh, which would more appropriately take into account the distributions of the returns. And we could uh, introduce a black Lehrman model which would take into account more qualitative aspects. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so another, another that's, that could be another also uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, improvement. These, absolutely. And some of these, probably there are libraries out there, right? Yes, so Monique. Let, let's talk about that after for the fall. Yeah. I'm curious, that could be interesting stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so looking forward, uh, there are ways to improve the expected returns. Uh, so, for example, for the neural network, uh, there could be some hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and for the Markowitz model, uh, we could have some of those improvements that I just talked about on the last slide. Uh, so, uh, going on, uh, that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, we will be glad to take them. Oh, this is fantastic. It's good work. Very good. And you know what makes it good is the fact that it doesn't end, right? It's, there's, there's more we could do to it. Um, to, uh, yeah, definitely don't want to, I don't wanna lose the momentum on a project like that. I, I've got a bunch of new students coming in in the fall. Uh, I will share with them the video and see if I can get some interest for them to pick it up. Professor, I was yeah. gonna add one thing. Yes, Brian. It's kind of two pronged. There's a finance aspect of this. And then you could go down a deep, dark rabbit hole of machine learning applied to, to kind of what I did. Yeah. Um, someone who yes. just like loves computer science could definitely like take my code and run with it. Um, so I guess it's a kind of a two pronged project. Yeah. Correct. We'll do that. Yeah, uh, Nisha, I don't know if you know, but um, so Randy also got a job. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So both of you and Jordan and uh, Brian. Brian didn't get a job. I have a, I have a data science. I'm doing data science this summer with. Okay. But he's not graduating. No, so I'm he's not. Got an internship. Though. Okay. All oh, right, right, right. Yes. So the other two guys, Jordan and Randy, you guys have graduated, right? In fact, it was last week yeah. the graduation ceremony. Yeah, just a few days ago. Oh, okay. So it's so sorry. I you know uh, I just couldn't make it work last week. So you guys had to come back to defactorial. Yeah. So. Uh, I was kind of like, got a late start to it. I didn't take uh, the first few actuarial exams until after I graduated uh, for my bachelor's actually. Mm. Um, so like, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the career path, but there's a series of exams you have to take. Yeah, they're quite challenging, like quite a few yeah. exams. Yes. Yeah. And um, um, yeah. so I had, uh, I really like math and that's what led me to this uh, master's program. And I think it's definitely provided me a great skill set uh, for an actuarial role. Fantastic. And where are you going to be based? Yeah, so it's actually in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, right outside of D.C. And I start in just three weeks. So I'm getting ready to move. All right. Good luck. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to be working at Hamilton Lane um, up in Philly doing uh, as a quantitative research analyst. So essentially, it's an investment firm on the buy side that takes pride in like data driven solutions. And I'm essentially uh, working on their proprietary database, helping drive like investment decisions, investment strategy, um, and then portfolio nice. construction and risk. Nice. And where are you based? Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a mostly fund of funds. Ah, okay, okay. But they also like do co-investments and everything. Okay, so all this stuff you did here, 
are going yeah. to be relevant, right? It, it, it's, I think a lot of it's going to carry through. Um, I think half to two thirds of my job is uh, coding in R though. And we did most of this project in Python, but there's some transferable skills. 